open discussion 可以给大家讲一下呃这个这个呃这个民事 complaint 的情况。那么呃我们还有呃胡胡池胡成胡池明教授啊，正和胡正明教授 ，sorry。Can tell from the <laughs> the spelling, yeah. Uh, 胡教授呢，就是说这个呃，很多呃弯曲的，就是特别搞这个，就是半导体的产，就是产业的工程上的大调人。他是呃，原来是那个呃，台积电 TSMC 的那个 CTO。呃，那么他现在是胡教授，现在是在那个呃 UC Berkeley 做这个 professor。本人呢，他是呃 ，it's 呃 board member of AD Twenty。National uh, Education Foundation, 就是 AD Twenty， 呃，也是一个呃，相当于一个那个呃呃民呃民权呃民权组织，那么有一个 Education Foundation。胡教授呢是呃 Board Director， 呃，另外他是 Vice President of Friends of Children with Special Need， 呃 ，of Vermont。呃，胡教授本人呢，他有 forty patents。And uh, it's a very renowned uh, technologist and in the semiconductor area. Uh, we have one more person that uh, maybe people, uh, a lot of people have heard of what, what currently, and he's the uh, creator of the uh, Proposition 209. A lot of people, actually, including the organization SB, were actually uh, born with the SCA5. So a lot of people heard about it. SCA5 was kind of the Revert, uh, reverse the purpose into an eye and basically that uh, uh, you, uh, remove the clouds of that to, uh, uh, you know, and the college admission, the UC system uh, and uh, uh, the state university and the remote clouds uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, colorblind. So it's kind of implicit. And uh, uh, so the, the 209 was created by Mr. Walt Connolly. And unfortunately, I think uh, he uh, he won't be able to attend today's panel uh, with a potential health problem. And uh, but we have four other panelists that they're about to take us to what's going on in the, uh, the action against the uh, discrimination and college admission, and then what's going to happen. Uh, what's happening now is what's you know going to happen later. Okay, now I'm going to pass uh, my uh, mic to. Uh, Mr. Ed Bloom, and he's going to give us an introduction. Great. Well, I'm just delighted to be here. This is the fourth group of uh, Chinese Americans that I have addressed in the last, uh, I guess maybe now about three months. I addressed a group in Long Island, New York. Uh, a very large group um, in Livingston, New Jersey, uh, one in Houston, and now one in Northern California. Uh, I am also delighted, this is the first time that my uh, the real lawyer uh, behind these cases has joined me, Will Consovoy, and I want to introduce Will's partner, um, Mike Park, who is sitting in the back. Mike, would you stand up? Mike and Will clerked for U.S. Supreme Court justices uh, the same year, uh, remained friends, and now they find themselves uh, in a, uh, a battle uh, against some of America's uh, most powerful uh, uh, educational institutions. Uh, that battle uh, was um, uh, begun really quite some time ago, and I want to I want to do two things in my 15 minutes or so. I want to tell everyone about the, the legal history of, of the attempt to end the use of race and ethnicity in higher education. I want to talk you through about three different cases that have occurred over the last 40 years. And then I want to talk briefly about the Harvard case and then turn it over to Will so Will can go into some detail. About, uh, about what we're doing with Harvard. But our story, the story of equality, really begins not far from this, from this room. It begins at the University of California at Davis back in the 1970s when a man named Alan Bakke 
apply to the University of California at Davis Medical School. Back then, Davis took 100 students annually to become physicians. And Alan Bakke was rejected by the University of California at Davis. And he found out that the reason he was rejected was that every year of those 100, 16 of those slots were set aside for what Davis called underrepresented minorities, primarily African Americans and Latinos. And although Alan Bakke's grades and his test scores were higher than uh, those 16 individuals, uh, he was denied admission anyway. He sued. Uh, he lost. His case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that uh, Alan Bakke was unfairly denied admission to the University of California's medical school. He was denied admission because Davis had a hard, fast, numeric quota that balanced out whites and blacks and Hispanics. And the, and the Supreme Court said that those kinds of quotas are unconstitutional. Now, what the Supreme Court didn't do was to say that the use of race and ethnicity in all forms of higher education admissions are unconstitutional. So, now we have case law that allows the use of race but forbids racial quotas. The next big case that came along came in 2003 in a pair of cases out of the University of Michigan. One white student um, uh, sued, arguing that the University of Michigan's undergraduate program was a quota. And another student, a white student, both white, both females, argued that the University of Michigan's law school admissions policy were quotas also. This was a very high profile case that took place in 2003. And uh, the Supreme Court gave us uh, sort of a split ruling. In the undergraduate case, they, they clarified that uh, uh, that program was also a quota. But in the University of Michigan's law school case, they decided that that program was not a quota. And that, sadly, and this is where those of us who labor in the movement to end racial classifications and preferences were, were deeply disappointed. The Supreme Court said that the use of racial classifications and preferences is legal. It is, uh, it is something that can be done as long as it's done with a delicate touch. And what did the Supreme Court mean by that? What did it mean by quotas, or not quotas, but preferences are, are permitted in order to achieve diversity, but they have to be done in a very delicate way? Well, this is how I think most of us interpreted that. And that is that before a university turns to using race and ethnicity, it must first attempt to find a race-neutral way of achieving diversity uh, uh, before raising the bar for some and lowering the bar for others. It was a disappointment, um, but an interesting thing happened the day that that Supreme Court opinion came down. And that was that the University of Texas, who had not been using race and ethnicity up until that point, made an announcement that they were going to reintroduce race and ethnicity in their admissions system. That was the day that I think many of us realized that this was going to be a new court case that would ask the court to revisit this racial preference system. So the day that that case was announced, the Gruder and Gratz cases from Michigan, I began looking for a student who had been rejected from the University of Texas, a white or an Asian student who had been rejected from the University of Texas, to sue the university arguing that because they have a successful race-neutral means, 
in place at the university that adding racial preferences on top of that was unconstitutional. It took me three years to find a plaintiff. Her name is Abigail Fisher. She grew up in Houston. She graduated in the top 11th percentile of her class. That's an important number to remember in that case, because if you were in the top 10% of your class, regardless of your SAT scores, you could then attend the University of Texas. So Abigail was just 1% point below the automatic admissions. So uh, Abigail uh, agreed to file a lawsuit against the University of Texas. This is where Will Consovoy and his old law firm come in. Uh, they were retained by, uh, by my Legal Defense Foundation to represent Abby in court. And in 2008, they sued the University of Texas. Uh, we lost at the district court level. We lost at the appellate court level. This is the Fifth Circuit. Uh, and we appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And thank goodness, in 2012, the Supreme Court took that case and arguments were made. And um, uh, a few months after those arguments were made, the Supreme Court came out with an interesting opinion uh, that I'll try to explain to you. We won that case. It was a seven to one opinion. Justice Kagan was recused because she had worked on the case uh, as Solicitor General in the Obama administration before she was appointed to the court. Uh, we won it, and we won an important principle but we didn't win procedurally what we wanted to win. So what the court said in their opinion, and this opinion applies to every institution of higher education in the country, is that once again, if you're going, if a university is going to use race and ethnicity, it must do so with a very light touch. And if race neutral alternatives are available, those must be employed before turning to race-based affirmative action. You might have some questions on this during Q&A, and uh, we can go into some detail on it. So they vacated the lower court opinion and sent it back for further hearings and briefings. We went back to Texas, Will and his team. Uh, we made a new round of briefing. We made uh, a, a new round of argument, but once again, we lost at the lower courts, and once again, Will and Mike uh, and uh, uh, their legal team have appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court to take the case once again. Now, it's very timely what is happening in this room and what is happening with the Harvard lawsuit, because hopefully this Monday, uh, the Supreme Court will make an announcement that they will take up the Fisher case once again. If that happens, and that's what we're hopeful for, then our lawsuits against Harvard, our lawsuits against the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the, uh, the tremendous um, uh, uh, energy that went into filing uh, a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights by 64 Asian groups throughout the country. All of this coalesces, all of this comes together in an important moment in legal and American history. And that, that moment it was encapsulated, I think, and begun not far from here with people in this room who decided that the reintroduction of race and ethnicity as a factor in university admissions, here in the state of California, when SCA 5 was proposed, would not happen. That this was a bridge too far. And that, and that Californians, all Californians, regardless of race or ethnicity, have benefited from the elimination of race-based policies. And people in this room began an effort to end that campaign, that legislative effort, and it was successful. So it was done here through a, a grassroots effort in California. Will and Mike and his legal team are, 
are, are you know, poised to take, take the Fisher case back to the Supreme Court. And now that leads us to these new lawsuits that were filed uh, last year, November 17th of last year. Uh, those two lawsuits um, are styled Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard and Students for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And in these two lawsuits, we make bold legal arguments. Let me talk about uh, Harvard, because I think that's the most interesting case for, for this crowd. We argue, and we assert, and we provide a wealth of data and historical information that Harvard today has a quota system that limits the number of Asians it will accept. And just like we learned in, in the 1970s at the University of California, Davis, that quotas are illegal, uh, back then we assert that Harvard has a quota that is nearly identical to what Davis had uh, 40 years ago. And it's interesting, these kinds of quotas have not only been in effect for the last 40 years, they've really been in effect for close to 100 years. Because back in the 1920s, Harvard University, in 1924, the freshman class of Harvard University was 27% Jewish. Now, I happen to be Jewish. I wasn't alive in 1924. But, but think about this. The Jewish population of the United States back in 1924 was barely 1%. Yet 27% of Harvard's incoming freshmen were Jewish. How did that happen? Well, it happened much the same way that we're seeing 42% of incoming freshmen at Berkeley. We're seeing 40 plus percent incoming freshmen at Caltech, also Asian. Well, we're seeing that, that minority groups that put a great emphasis on education can overcome socioeconomic disadvantages and excel in higher education. What did Harvard do back in 1924 when their incoming freshman class was 27%? They initiated something called the Harvard Plan, the new Harvard Plan. And what was that plan? That plan was designed to basically cut off, limit, diminish the number of Jewish students that it admitted. When the new Harvard plan went into effect, grades and test scores became uh, uh, diminished in Harvard's admissions process. And something called leadership and something <laughs> called um, uh, geographic diversity uh, became elevated. So. Uh, grades and test scores, uh, not so important anymore. Leadership uh, and, and geographic diversity now became much more important. What happened to Jews uh, at Harvard the following year? Anybody want to guess? Well, I'll tell you what happened. They went from 27%, I think, down to about 10%. If that's, and they, they stayed at 10%, I think, for about 40 years. And it crept up a little bit. Now, what's happening at Harvard today? I'm going to let Will talk about this, but I'm going to leave you with one, with one statistic and then one request. In 1992, 17% of Harvard's incoming freshman class were Asian. In 2012, about 20 years later, about 19% of Harvard's incoming freshman class were Asian. Yet during this period of time, the number of Asians applying to Harvard, we think, based on our preliminary uh, studies, better than double, perhaps coming close to tripling. And those Asians who score 2,200 or higher on their SATs, we think make up at least 50% of Asian, of uh, Harvard's Asian applicant pool. So we're deep into this litigation now. Um, there are three things that I need help with, and I'm hopeful everyone in this room will help us with this and spread the word. 
Uh, Students for Fair Admissions is a, is a membership organization. We now have 400 members, and we need more. Uh, it costs nothing to join. There are two kinds of classifications of memberships. We need people who uh, are parents. You don't have to be Asian. We need anyone who supports the goal of ending quotas and race-based affirmative action in higher education to join us. And all that you have to do to do that is to go to our website, Students for Fair Admissions, and fill out our, our sort of our application form. And we ask for your name, we ask for your email address, and I think we ask for your zip code. That's all we ask. Uh, we will send you a, a thank you for joining, but it costs you nothing, and your names will remain private. We don't share those names with anyone. Next, if, if you are a student who has been rejected from a competitive university, if you've been rejected from Harvard or Yale or Stanford or wherever, there is also an application form. There, we're, we're asking for your name, your email, and tell us something about yourself. Tell us the year that you applied to these various schools and the schools that rejected you. And tell us something about your grades. Tell us about your SAT scores and your, and your extracurricular activities. Those students, we will contact directly and ask them that with their permission, if, if the court wants to know or Harvard wants to know who these students are, that we could provide them uh, 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 those names and, and background. And Will will go into some greater detail on that. And then finally, finally, we need your financial support. We need to prove to the courts, and we need to prove to Harvard that we are a legitimate organization, that we have hundreds, if not perhaps thousands of members who support us financially. And you can make a donation right on our website. I don't care if it's just $10. I don't care if it's $5. I would like more, but uh, $10 will do just fine. And for those of you who can afford more, we would welcome that. Um, these lawsuits are enormously expensive, enormously expensive, even though Will and his legal team are uh, providing counsel for a fraction of what a national firm will provide. So those are, the, those are the things that we're doing to end this kind of discrimination that's been in effect for way too long. Those are the things that I would like uh, all of you to do individually and collectively, and now I'll ask uh, Will to tell us more about the lawsuits. Thank you. Everybody hear me okay?